Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I want to talk to you tonight about dreaming the impossible and seeing the invisible. Um, for some of you in here tonight, by the time you understand what it's all about, it might be too late for you to do anything about what it's all about. Um, in the words of uh, somebody, I'm trying to think of his name now, whose face I can see, but it's a sign of age. I'm thinking of Robbie Williams. <laughs> In the words of the great Robbie Williams, youth is wasted on the young. You, you have to kind of be my age to understand that, but youth is wasted on the young. Um, because by the time you've figured out all what you can do with your strength and your ability, it's, you kind of can't always do all that anymore. And I want you to catch something tonight as we talk about dreaming the impossible and seeing the invisible. So um, I've got one scripture. I just want to read one verse from, from the New Testament from the book of Acts. Um, it's Acts chapter 2 and verse 17. <clears throat> and here's what it says. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Whose spirit? On, on how much flesh? Now, I'm also long enough, uh, long enough in the tooth and old enough to know the shenanigans and schemings and mischief that we have gotten up to in our development of this thing called Christianity and the church, um, that somehow we have managed to figure that all doesn't mean all. Yeah, we have 57 reasons why all doesn't mean all. It just means some. It just means a few. It just means those who qualify. But correct me if I'm wrong, but it, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, now, that doesn't mean everybody will recognize and realize the spirit that's poured upon them, but nevertheless, it's poured upon all flesh, all genders, all times, with all kinds of struggles, of all religions, wherever you're from. Now, now, that's not saying that I agree with all religions, but it's saying that his spirit is poured on all flesh. There is a wonderful opportunity on all of humanity to experience something that is an expression of the Spirit of God himself. And he says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, I don't think that necessarily means, uh, when I was raised, every prophecy started with what? Or, no, see, thus saith the Lord was quite important, but yea, 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 verily. So I was raised, it was really, thus saith the Lord was pretty important, but you better listen if there was a yea, verily. I even knew people who did a few, yea, verily, yea, yea, verily, yea, doth the Lord say, yes, the Lord saith unto thee, and it, it was fun, fun days, fun days. I've done a few yea, verilies myself. I look back now and, you know, you think, you listen to that coming out of the mouth of like a 12-year-old, and it, it kind of sounds kind of weird to me now, but... He didn't at the time. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. I don't think he means that you guys will go around saying, yea, verily, thus saith the Lord. I think it means something about your life that speaks about what is to come and reveals it and shows it in a way that people say, I want some of that. And he says, your young men shall see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Now, some wisecrack said the reason old men dream dreams is because they take more naps. <laughs> Which is partly true, but that's not really what this means. It's about a partnership between, you would think that the young people would be the dreamers. And the old guys would be the visionaries. But he flips it on its head. He said, no, 
The old men are going to dream things, but you're going to be the visionaries. You're going to be the people that take those dreams and make those dreams practical reality to change the world. So we talked a few weeks ago about how much does it cost to live here. Do you remember that? How Paul Scanlon, the, the founder of uh, Life Church Bradford, used to walk through a very middle class expensive area on the way to work from the council on the way to school from the council estate and ask his friend how, do you, how much do you think it would cost to live here? Because at that young age you realise that there is a cost to where we choose to live not just, not just in terms of bricks and mortar but in terms of where you want to live in your life there is a, there is a cost and for us as a house there is a cost that goes with where we want to live and so I showed you a picture, this was the picture of an icebreaker. Um, I showed you that because when we're talking about prophesying and knowing, I've had spoken over me and to me on many, many occasions by different unconnected people, all the same kind of thing about arrowhead and spearhead, and that, that's also been part of the call of this house. And the significant one that began to arise um, is the one of icebreaker about being an ice-breaking church and being an ice-breaking leader. And so um, I, I, I quoted this to you the other week. The problem with icebreakers is that they're noisy and expensive to run. They do not carry passengers and are unstable in the open sea. Their sole job is to make a path for others to follow. You may call that undesirable, I call it purpose. I call that doing something from which others are the primary beneficiary. I call that pioneering. I call that boldness. Now, now listen to this. They sometimes get stuck. But they carry on doing what they were designed to do. <clears throat> this is the Rock of York and all who sail in her. God bless the Rock of York. Yeah. Uh, so what do you notice about this picture? Pete Condy alerted me to this after he'd seen it. It's not going anywhere. The people are all outside on the ice. We've got a jolly ladder, everybody down there doing their little bit, taking pictures of the ship. That's not what icebreakers are supposed to do. And uh, I would be honest enough and, and hopefully humble enough to say that, that, that as an icebreaker, there have been times when we've got stuck. And uh, it's not what we were designed for and... Uh, uh, one of the things that the biggest icebreakers have when they get stuck, they have special motors that they only use at a particular time that allow the ship to woggle, okay? It has to woggle itself free because the, the ice tightens against the hull, so you first of all got to have some wiggle room. You've got to wiggle a bit, okay? We've got to wiggle a bit to get free. And sometimes what has to happen, because icebreakers actually ride up on top of the ice and use their weight to break the ice. Sometimes you've got to back up a little bit. And I think as a house, we've probably got stuck a little on our ice breaking and we've had to back up a little bit. Uh, but this is a new day. And it's a new season. And it's okay, it happens to icebreakers. But you carry on, we're carrying on as an icebreaker. We are not going for a refit to become a passenger liner to see how many passengers we can carry and what we can put on to make that happen. We have to continue if we are going to be honest to the call of God and what His Spirit is on our flesh. We have to be honest to the call of being icebreakers, challenging thinking, stretching convention, making you lot have to push somewhere and press somewhere and break some ice. So... In 1492, Christopher Columbus, the great explorer, was having a battle against the common held view that the earth was flat. 1492, still believing the earth was a disk, right? And because they believed that, some people thought Christopher Columbus was a fool because they said, if you go to the horizon and go beyond the horizon, you'll fall off and we'll never see you again. Well, he didn't fall off the end of the earth. What they said wasn't true. He actually discovered a new world. But that was the prevailing fear when he set off on his quest, but he went anyway, right? Even though they said the earth is flat and you don't know what's beyond the horizon, he went anyway, okay? 
So, so here's what I want to say. First of all, unless, unless in your life you see beyond the horizon, you will live with the flat earth mentality. Like many Christians, flat earth mentality. The earth is flat. There's nothing new to learn. If we go beyond that thought, if we press into that area, we'll fall off the end and we won't be saved anymore. It's not true. It's not true. And the truth is, unless you're willing to say goodbye to the shore, you'll never discover new horizons. There's a word for some of you. And if you don't have the spirit of Christopher Columbus, you'll never go anywhere new. I love, I love what is reported to be said by Christian Columba, Chris, Christopher Columbus, but I heard this in church, so it's probably not true, but I like it anyway. <laughs> it's these monkeys of preachers who make up statements that Christopher Columbus said, well, I don't know, maybe he did, I don't know. Uh, I hope he did, and if he didn't, he should have. <laughs> uh, he said this, he said, when I left, I didn't know where I was going. And when I got there, I didn't know where I was. <laughs> Think about it. Isn't that incredible wisdom? When I left, I didn't know where I was going. And when I got there, I didn't know where I was. You see, the true spirit of a pioneer, of, of, of someone who takes life on, or who grabs it by the horns and goes with it, is we didn't really know where we're going, and when we got there, we didn't know where we were, but that's the discovery that then creates what they call the new world. I gave you a couple of great illustrations about how we look at things. Remember the illustration I gave you about the stars? That when you go out tonight, look into the sky and you see a star, you're not seeing what you think you see. Because that star isn't any number of light years away, anything up to thousands of light years away that you see. So what you actually will see tonight when you go out looking the sky is not actually there as you see it, because what you're seeing happened a long time ago. Now, get your head around that, it fascinates me. If a star is 100 light years away, and I see it in the sky tonight, I'm seeing something that happened 100 years ago, but I'm seeing it now. The other wonderful illustration I gave you is about the sunrise, when I asked you if anybody has seen a sunrise, and everybody said, yeah, we've seen the sunrise, and I told you, you are liars. The reason I told you, you are liars, is because the sun has never risen. From the foundation of the earth, the sun has never risen. It stayed exactly where it is. And the earth has gone around the sun, and the earth has spun on its axis, and we have had the illusion that the sun is rising when actually it isn't. The, the earth is moving. There are movements that are taking place that give the impression that the sun is rising. Now, here's the great danger, and I want to learn you to learn this as a lesson of life. To say you saw a sunrise is an accurate description of what you saw, but it's wrong. And there are many things that we can give an accurate description of what we saw, but it's wrong. Because we've never taken into account the movement that occurs to give that illusion. My whole thing in ministry is not to look for the sunrise, and it's to look for the movements, the movements in life, the movements of God, the movements that are within the Word of God that help us to see that what we sometimes explain as being one thing is actually something else that is much more powerful. It's something universal. It's something incredible. It's something totally amazing. So, these stars and sunrise things illustrate that we can accurately describe what we think we see and yet be wrong, and so lack the will to participate in what is really going on, is my point. The question is, what the flip is really going on? Because if you just sun rises, sun goes down, sun rises, sun goes down, in your view, but it doesn't either rise nor go down, what the flip is really going on is the challenge of life. And that's what this, 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 this verse in the book of Acts is all about. So let me just give a couple of definitions and I'm going to tell you a couple of things, okay? 
In a dream, I mean, you've had a dream. I don't mean, you know, I had a dream. Not what, I mean, a dream, you know, a dream. How many of you know that in a dream, things bend out of shape in the space-time continuum? Dreams just don't stick to the rules. How many of you have realized that? Dreams do not stick to the rules. It's like the time-space continuum, this, 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 this amazing process of physics, it's like, it's like it gets bent out of shape when we have dreams. Listen to this, dreams bend reality to fit the story. Do you hear that? Dreams bend reality to fit the story. Have you noticed in a dream that reality gets bent? in ways that fit the story, sometimes in a very frightening way, sometimes in a very wonderful and delightful way, usually depending on your state of heart and mind when you begin to dream, and all dreams in life tend to be like that. See, living in a dream means the laws of nature do not abide within their preconceived boundaries. You get that? The laws of nature in a dream don't abide within their preconceived boundaries. And so when I talk about having a dream from God, about something that's in your heart that you have there, that you begin to see, I can guarantee you a couple of things. It will bend out of shape the space-time continuum. It will bend reality to fit that story. Story. It will make the laws of nature not abide within their preconceived boundaries. Now let's say a word about a vision. A vision lets you see that which is invisible by any other means than seeing from within. Okay? A vision lets you see that which is invisible by any other means and seeing from within. Your young men shall see visions. Okay, young men, what about it? And I think young women as well. Seeing that which is invisible by any other means and seeing from within. You ain't going to learn that in college. Are we going to train you to do that? And your old men will dream dreams. What about it, old men and old women or middle-aged women and middle-aged Men, because I don't know what old is. Dreams that bend things out of shape. Dreams, dreams that bend reality to fit the story. Dreams that the laws of nature don't abide within. Life has a strange way of presenting us with opportunities that try to call us into something beyond ourselves. And I would rather refer to that as the call of God. We try not to use a lot of religious terminology here for obvious reasons. But this idea of the call of God is very real and it's very particular and it's very special and it's very experiential and it's known by me and I have lived in the call of God and I doubt it not one little bit. But there are many of you who've never even considered, is the call of God on my life? I don't mean that in some religious, you know, go take religious orders, become a nun or whatever. Or a, you know, if it is, it is. I, you know, I'm, but I mean, I mean in all of your life, it might not be that direction, but the call of God on your life, something bigger that has a dream that's starting to bend the forces of nature and a vision that's seeing what you can't see unless you see it from inside. Who did he pour his spirit on? Who? All. So why not you? Dream, vision, time, circumstance, bending to fit the dream. Seeing things that nobody could show you but could only come from within. My dad, bless his heart, he would have been 90 this year, born in 1926, had a dream one night, and in his dream, 
he was walking along a road and he came to a signpost at the entrance to a community. And in his dream, he stopped and he read the signpost. And the signpost said, M-A-L-A-I-G, Malague. And um, he walked past the sign into the village and somebody said, why are you here? And he said, I'm not really sure at the moment. But then as he looked around, he saw people with a lot of need. And uh, in my dad's terms, because the, these things, dreams always work within the constraints of what speaks to you and what you understand. So in his old context, he realized he was there to make a difference to this little community. And so, so how many of you know a gospel tract was? <laughs> so he pulled a bunch of gospel tracts off, out of his pocket, didn't know why they were there, starts telling people about Jesus and handing these out and praying for people. It was absolutely amazing. And everybody was responding and he woke up. Absolutely shocked. Because Maleg is a real place. It, it's in Scotland. It's near, it's near, it's, it's way north of, 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 on the other side. Near Fort William. It's out that way, I think on the west side. It's a real place. My dad had never been there. He didn't know that it existed, but he'd seen it in this dream. And he had seen what he was doing. And that was amazing and he didn't go. Now, I don't think there's any judgment or condemnation on dad because you know those things are not easy he has a young family he's at home and in fact uh, uh, at a point just after that my father had decided we would emigrate to New Zealand he felt that was the course of our life and so he had all of the papers all of the emigration papers there and they were on the table and we were going to move to New Zealand. He'd signed for the grants and everything. All that he had to do was send the final papers back. But something stopped him because at that time my grandmother was not well. And a little bit like Riley with us, which is really weird how these things work. I was raised for the first six years of my life in my grandmother's house because she was ill and my mother needed to look after her. So dad didn't go. But no one can doubt that there were forces at work in my dad moving to York in 1962. It's almost like that didn't pan out, but the dream was still bending things. The dream was still working things. And my dad was a, was a South Yorkshire coal miner. Hey up, lad, how's that going on? You're eight, cock. Now you imagine I came to York, posh York, Talking like that. First day at school, hey up, cock. Didn't go down, didn't go down too well, I can tell you. Uh, everybody thought I talked funny. Um, and, and some of you know the story how we finished up in York. Totally miraculous, totally, absolutely ridiculous. Talk about God bending things. I've told you one of the key factors of that. My father came here with no money. Somebody got him a job. They had nowhere to live. He came with everything that he owned from where we lived. And, uh, and um, a lady saw him in the church, didn't know him, went to the pastor, said, who's that young man? The pastor said, he's moving here. She said, tell him I'll buy him a house. And she bought a house and gave it to my mum and dad, not for free, but for what they could afford. And so you imagine now, you guys who can't get a mortgage, somebody buying a house, and you say, well, I can't afford it, watch the payments. And they said, just give me whatever you can, and we'll be right. That, that did a couple of things. Number one, it got us to York, and it got me to York. And needless to say, I wouldn't be where I am doing what I'm doing, fulfilling what I'm fulfilling, if that event had not happened and something hadn't bent. Something bent to get my mother and father here because the New Zealand thing didn't work, otherwise I'd have been a Kiwi with Graham. And the Malay thing didn't work, otherwise I'd have been the okay, was, it, would, it wouldn't have been a up cock. It'd be the new, the new, the new. I'd have been a little Scot. Is that not good, Graham? Is that not a good... <laughs> I'm not a good Scots impression. 
That's probably why we didn't move then, because I'd have messed up the... <laughs> but instead, things kept bending, so the dream began to take a different form. And that dream took the form of bringing us here, where, where the call of God touched my life. I finished up in this wonderful place, and incidentally, I have been here now for 50... Four years, be 55 years this coming September. I have been in this church as, as boy and man, grown up, and, and God worked something for me within the context of this house, but there have also been lots of other things that, that tie in with that, because there was a greater purpose and significance yet unfilled that was still working, even though Dad didn't go and fulfill that. So what happens? I, have a, I hear a voice. I have a dream. We see Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, just as weird as my dad seeing Maleg, Scotland, but we went. Now, that doesn't mean dad failed and we succeeded. What it meant is that that dream was still bending things and moving things and saying, I'm going to do something. I'm going to make something happen through your seed, Chapman. And I told you, which is not bad, when you realize my grandfather was the bastard child of a servant born in a workhouse in absolute poverty, rejected, never adopted, carrying shame and dismay, but now able to bring courage and life to other people flowing through the line because it bent the time thing. We came from Hemsworth Workhouse, poor house, to this. That's not a bad journey, is it? And so God spoke to us and we, Chris and I, 30 years ago, upped and fulfilled that same call, just from hearing a voice of God, just hearing about something. And the story's amazing, but that's not the story that I want to tell you about tonight, because it still goes on. The dream, the vision, and I want you to catch it. What could God do with you if only you were willing? Some of you have never even thought about whether God wants to do anything with you. So you've never even asked the question, am I willing if he wants me to do something? In 1986, we packed three suitcases and got the hand of a three-year-old and took him to another country where we didn't know anybody and nobody knew us and had the most dynamic, tremendous time of learning about the God of miracle, the God of prophecy, the God whose spirit is poured out on all flesh, the God who makes you dream dreams and see visions, who bends things remarkably. What about you? What could God do with you if only you were willing? And that doesn't mean I can be free for two hours after 3.30 next Thursday or the week after that, okay? Which tends to be a cultural thing now. Well, I could probably fit God in Two weeks on Thursday, but it'll have to be after three because I've got, I've got a hair appointment. But if you can... And that's only a maybe. No, no, see, this is really important stuff, guys. This is really important stuff because, because things bend and things move when you're in dream and in vision and, and it's in your best interest to say, Lord, I'm here, I'm willing. It means wake up. Because something of eternal significance is trying to catch your undivided attention. But listen to this. God is never so much interested in your ability as he is in your availability. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it's so very, very true. God is not so much interested in your ability as he is in your availability. Availability is important to God. When you make yourself available... Time begins to bend. Things begin to bend. You start to become able because you were available. But you don't become available because you are able. In fact, the problem is the more we think we are able, the less available we become to what it is God's trying to do because we start living in our own strength and planning our own life and then we miss this thing and reach a point where we say, if only I had... So, 86, we went off to this place called Scott's Bluff. Lots of other stories I could tell you, but and I want to give you story up to date. Still dreaming, still vision. 
So, uh, last year, it's now last year, isn't it? Last year, last year. Chris was working away on, on uh, a tab, and suddenly on the screen, I've told you this before, but I need it to build up the story, I'm going to tell you, on the screen pops up this. She wasn't looking for it, she was looking for wreaths. Autumn wreaths, okay? Now, that's, that doesn't look much like an autumn wreath to me. She's looking for autumn wreaths. This pops up on the screen, just bang. She comes and tells me, have you seen this? Now, of course, it wouldn't mean much to any of you. You think, oh, that's stupid. But the issue is, that wagon is by Scott's Bluff, Nebraska. You can see part of the bluff behind it. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt, know where this is. Bang, suddenly, the dream is still going on. And reality is bending. You say, how is it bending? Because it was nowhere on the search engine. It was nowhere in Google. It was nowhere in the memory. You could not find on her tab how that possibly got there. There was no trail to lead to this. And I know how it got there because there was a dream. And suddenly things bend to fit the dream. What was interesting is that same week I had been upstairs in the office looking at another picture, and this is what I was looking at. That, but that is actually next to the other wagon at Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. The next picture is the one that I was looking at, which is Connie. That's the only time you're going to see topless in church, isn't it, babe? <laughs> She's like, I don't know. Who, who can tell? <laughs> who knows what we might have to do to pull in the crowds? That's my girl. Yeah, that's my girl. That's that same wagon. That's Connie at four years of age. When we visited back in the very wagon, next to that wagon, what's fascinating is Riley's four years of age. When all this is happening, Joel was three and four years of age when we went. So Joel was three into four. Connie was four there. Riley is four. You talk about the dream pulling all the factors together to say, hey, listen. And so... In view of that, I told her, I, got, I heard God as clear as day say, so I want you to go on a pilgrimage. I want you to go back the way that you went, go back to Scott's Bluff, because in the meantime, we'd also heard something else. We both have a burden in our heart for Salt Lake City, Mormon capital of the world. People there desperate, desperate, desperate for the truth about grace and new covenant to free them from bondage and heartache. Lots of, lots of lapsed. Mormons who still want God but don't want religion who need help. And our hearts began to, you know, we, we've had this on us for over three years now, almost four years. Uh, we've been turning this over. And so I hear this, and so we last year went on this pilgrimage. And I, when I talk about vision, I saw, I saw a triangle where we were supposed to go into Denver, where we went originally, up to Scotts Bluff. And then follow the trail, the North Platte River, which was the Pioneer Trail, going west, okay? Follow it all the way down until you pioneer yourself into, into Salt Lake City, which is then a triangle coming back. I've told you some of the things that happened on that journey, which were quite amazing. Lots of things that happened in Scotts Bluff, lots of discoveries that we made. What was fascinating is that when we went to the top of Scotts Bluff, which is just over here behind here, which we'd done many, many times. We stood at the end of the bluff and we read a plaque and it said, Brigham Young passed this place on his way to Salt Lake City on May the 27th, 1857. And uh, the only two names on there were Scott's Bluff and Salt Lake City. Scott, so you're in the middle, of, this is a 25,000 people community of two, a 13,000 and a whatever thousand makes up the 25,000, the other side of the river community. This, but two names on there, what are the two names we're carrying? Where are we going? Scotts Bluff, Salt Lake City. Hi. Dreams and visions, things bending. 
So lots of things with that. Discoveries that we had for the next phase of the journey. Then we finish up down in Scotts Bluff, and we've had a, a word that, that there'll be a guy called Carl who's significant. Salt Lake. In Salt Lake. Guy called Carl with a K. We knew that tattoo artists were significant. We already knew that. I had an interaction with some tattoo guys there, shared some amazing things with these tattoo guys just outside of Salt Lake City. And uh, we're told when you go there, the guy who's important is Carl. Chris Cook Googles Carl Tattoos. Right? That's pretty random, isn't it? Carl Tattoos, Salt Lake City. Up pops a guy called Carl Johnson, who didn't live in Salt Lake City. But he popped up. And Carl popped up. Carl with the K. So I contacted Carl. We found out that Carl was part of, lo and behold, the the. Chris, the Association of Christian Tattoo Artists. How random is that, right? This is Carl. This is just Carl with a K. How many Carl with a Ks are there? The one that we pick is a member of the Christian Alliance of Tattoo Artists, right? Or Alliance of Christian Tattoo Artists or whatever. And lo and behold, we find out he's 300 miles away. It's like, well, that's really weird. Because he's, 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 he's not here. But he, he has a shop called Zion Tattoo. In a place called St. George, Utah. I found that fascinating. Because here we are English people. St. George is the patron saint of England. And we're following Carl with a K. Who is a tattoo artist. And he lives in St. George. And lo and behold. The address of the tattoo shop is S. Bluff Road. Zion Tattoo's S. Bluff Road, St. George, Utah. So we've just come from Scott's Bluff, and here he is with his tattoo shop on S. Bluff. I think he might have been the guy. Just possibly dreams and visions. Reality bending. Reality bending to accommodate the dream. So I don't Facebook, you know that. It still irritates me half to death. Jesus never said, unfriend your enemies. He never said, block those you don't like. Jesus said, be friend, not unfriend. So I don't like Facebook anyway. That's, that's, that's another story. So I think, how do I get hold of him? The only thing I've got is a Facebook address. So yours truly gets on Facebook. And uh, I, I Facebook Carl. He replies within minutes. Um, I don't, I'm not in Salt Lake. I used to be in Salt Lake. Um, you know, do, what you're saying doesn't sound weird. You should meet my pastor. Who well, where's your pastor? My pastor is in Ogden, Utah, which is 30 miles north of Salt Lake City, which in American terms is like, you know, just up there. Okay. He's in Ogden, Utah. I still consider him my pastor, but I think you should talk to him. So then we find ourselves contacting Matt Roberts, the senior pastor of a church called the Genesis Project. It's a great name, isn't it? We find a guy who's got a heart like us. Now, I've been looking for three years for a guy with a heart like us, and I find a guy with a heart like us who says, hey, whatever you think God's telling you, we're on board, we're with you, we want to help you. So, you know, come back and see us. And um, so I did in October. I, uh, I went back to see Matt, spend a weekend um, with them. And uh, I flew into Salt Lake City. What was fascinating is everywhere I went, whether it was in the state capitol, which is the government building, everywhere I went, the paintings there were Ogden and Salt Lake City. I go upstairs, I look in a cage that's got old newspapers in. There's the Ogden Times and the Salt Lake City Times next to each other. Everything with these two things linked. You see, because stuff bends, reality bends to accommodate the dream. And the vision lets you see what you couldn't see except for what you see from inside in your heart. So, so this is all going on, so I took my way up to Ogden to, uh, to see him. When I get there, it's, it, I find it's hard to contact Matt at the beginning. So one of his guys on staff, Paul Widmark, contacts me, says, come and meet us at the coffee shop. I go and meet him, and I start to talk to him. He bursts into tears. 
And uh, I said, oh, I said, hey, you know, what's, is what I'm telling you sound a bit weird? He said, no. He said, what it is, I haven't heard anybody talk like this since my father died. He said, and I am so touched and so moved. But he said, what you also need to know, as I began to talk to him about our journey and the things we've learned, he said, two weeks ago, I said, God, I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. I have got so many questions about my historic beliefs and how I've come to them, and I don't know where to turn. He said, and then you turned up. And you started answering all the questions I was asking without me asking the questions, so I knew that it was God. See? Reality bending. So, I'm taking a bit of time here. What's also interesting, Graham and Jenny find this amusing. He took me to his house, and his house is in a place called Roy. Well, Roy is the abbreviation that we use all our time in our business dealings about Rock of York. Roy is what we use, so Paul lives in, in Roy. There are all sorts of little stuff like that. Anyway, comes time to leave there, and I'm thinking, okay, God, I, I need a word. I, I, need, I, know, I know that Salt Lake is on our hearts. I know there's something we have to do. I don't think it's detached from the rock. I think it's attached to the rock. I think we are part of a, a bigger picture. So I said, Lord, I just, please, I, I need a vision. I need to see something from the inside. I need things to bend. So... Uh, so I thought, right, where do I need to go? Murray. Now, Murray is a suburb of Utah. So, you know, like we have Acom and uh, Huntington and, you know, Dringhouses, all those places. Murray's a bit like that, but on a bigger scale because Salt Lake's a big city. So, Chris and I had found ourselves staying at Murray, and I thought, I just felt Murray is probably the place that I ought to go for whatever reason I ought to go. So, I get the sat-nav, and uh, I put Murray into the sat-nav, okay? And uh, a good, good, good bet if you're ever in America and you want to get to the middle of somewhere and you don't know what address to put in the sat-nav, try Main Street. Main Street's a winner most of the time. So I really felt I needed to put Main Street, Murray, not Main Street, Salt Lake, but Main Street, Murray. And then I had to put an address in, and I thought, what do I do? And, and I told the guys the wrong numbers the other night when I told them this. But um, as I went in, I, I started putting in numbers, and I finished up. The, the choice I was given was for 4200 Main Street, Murray, Utah. So I put 4200 Main Street, Murray, Utah in the sat-nav. And off we go, okay? 42 Main Street. Here we go. So we leave Ogden. We come down, we get in there, drive to Murray, and I drive into there thinking, God, is this the place? What, what are you telling me about our involvement in Salt Lake City? And so I drive to, 20, to 4200 Main Street, Murray, and I stop the car, and this is what I see. I kid you not, this is what I see, live here. Now, I, I, I was in two minds whether to share all this with you, because some of you can start having conjecture about that city. It's gone, they're, they're gone, Chris. <laughs> I, I, don't want you to, I don't want you to get ahead of what God is doing, because my personal view is that this is connected and interrelated to this house. This is something that's about us and not just about us, Okay. And remember, the world's a small place now. We live in a global village where you used to need a lot of effort to get from here to the south of England. Now you can cross the Atlantic and come back. Vicky's done it in for a day trip. <laughs> so, so I'm outside here, so I thought, well, I've got time to kill. I might as well go into the sales office. So I went in the sales office and said, well, so what have you got available? You know, it says, live here, what's... Um, he says, well, we've got several things available. Um, uh, can I show you, the, can I show you the, um, the, the show apartment and the brochure? So I said, yeah, please do. So she opens the brochure to show me the apartment that she's about to demonstrate to me, and this is the first page. <laughs> I kid you not, the name of the show apartment was York. 
So here I've come from your, all this story coming together. You, you, you think that reality bends. Wait, wait, that somebody back somewhere in deciding to build the Burke Hill Apartments had this brainwave. I think we'll make the first apartment on the brochure York. Because we've got loads of Yorks here. <laughs> there isn't a York in Utah. But so, do you see how, what I'm trying to show you is that, is, that, is that stuff was bending to fit the dream. Before I ever even encountered what the dream was to do, somebody stuck that notice on top of that apartment that can't be really read in many ways other than what it says. Before I got there, when I put 4200 Main Street, Murray, into the sat-nav, so that all this is speaking, 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 and you think God doesn't speak? You think all this is a bit of a fairy story? You think God doesn't call people? You think there isn't a destiny bigger than your small-mindedness that when God shows you somewhere, you get on and do it because he's with you? And so I go and have a look at the show one, but I said to her, I said, well, if we were to take one, as a base for the, the beginning of our ministry into, into Salt Lake, whatever that looks like, whatever that may be, bringing the voice, bringing, bringing our sound, bringing what we've learned to heal people to this community, then, then we would need something a little bigger. So I said, we probably need a, something with three beds, so you've got somewhere for someone to stay and an office, because they're pretty small. And so she showed me the big three-bed one, which, which this won't mean anything to you till I explain. The name of the other one is Kensington. So we've got York, we've got one in the middle, and we've got Kensington. Now, here's the important thing. When I first went looking for meaning in Salt Lake City, I felt led to go to a church called K2 and meet the pastor of K2. Now, that was not named after a ski, as any of you that know no ski equipment, know that there is a very good ski called K2. But actually it's called K2 because the name of the church is Kensington 2 because it's named after its mother church in, in Michigan called Kensington. So the two things are York and Kensington. Every connection was fitting with the experience and the journey that we have been walking. Now, there's one other thing, and then I'm going to wrap it up, because you've been very patient, and I've gone on for, for a while, but I don't think it's too long, because it's important, isn't it? So, Salt Lake City sits on the Wasatch Front Range. Now, one thing about Salt Lake City, you could get called there for reasons other than God. Okay, so you've got to be real careful with places like that, because... It's a microclimate, high valley, it's a mile above sea level, way up in the Rockies, and there's three major ski resorts within 30 minutes of downtown. I mean, that is pretty much as close to heaven as, as you're going to get. But that's not our reason for liking it. But then again, if you get the chance to experience it, it wouldn't be half bad, would it? So, it sits on the Wasatch Front Range. Now, on the Wasatch Front Range, there is a mountain. And it's a mountain that I've talked about many times, not recently, but it's called Mount Olympus. The reason I talked about Mount Olympus is because I have said most of the church draws most of its understanding not from Mount Zion, but from Mount Olympus. Not from the purposes of God, but from the thinking of the Greeks. And I mean that sincerely. And that our view of spirituality has become more influenced by Mount Olympus than in us by Mount Zion. Now, now, Mount Olympus is part of that front range, but guess what is under Mount Olympus? Murray, Utah. Not downtown Salt Lake City. Murray, Utah, the live here place with the York apartment that's linked to Kensington, sits right under Mount Olympus, which is the declaration of Greek philosophy rather than the true revelation of Christ the Son and God the Father touching people's lives. I think God might be speaking. 
I think sometime back in the past he said that chap has got this Mount Olympus thing on his head, so we'll put Murray under Olympus. We'll shuffle, we'll shuffle this. Some of you think it's crazy, but listen, when you have a dream, reality bends to accommodate the dream. And then you see what you could not see except for inside. So, here's, here's my last little thing. So, there's a guy called Stu Robert. Stu Robert is an Aussie MP. And a uh, uh, very, very prominent politician in, in the Australian Parliament. And we, we know Stu. Stu's been kind to us. And Stu suddenly emails me, says, I'm, or he WhatsApps me, says, I'm coming to York just for a few days with the family near New Year. Uh, love to meet up. Can we meet up if possible? And uh, so Stu randomly, randomly picks an Airbnb. Okay. And uh, he arrives in York and he sends me a picture. He said, you're not going to believe this. He says, this is the view from our window. And he sends me a picture of the church because he's, he's in the top apartment across the street from the church. Didn't know how to find us, so I don't know where they are. I'll look out for them. He comes and stays right in the apartment across the street, random by the Airbnb. Well, I don't call that random. I talk about how reality starts getting bent to accommodate a dream. Now, you say, what was all that about? Well, we went for a meal with Stu, and I shared some of these things with Stu, and I said, Stu, when I was 30, I didn't give a flip. It was like, well, come on, let's get on. You know, we loved God. We wanted to serve God. We believed in the call of God. We believed there were big things for our lives. So it was like, yeah, just three suitcases, three-year-old, let's go. Don't, who do you know? Nobody. Are you bothered? No. Well, within six weeks of being in that town, I was the senior pastor of the church that we were supposed to pastor, that somebody had seen in the vision that nobody interviewed me. And crazy. So I'm saying, Stu, I'm 60 now. I'll be 61 in March. And uh, he looked across the table at me, and this is what he said. He said, don't you think if a 30-year-old could do what needed doing in Salt Lake City, God would have called a 30-year-old. But haven't you thought maybe it needs a 60-year-old in that community with those people who's got some wear under the shoes, who's got some experience, some been through some stuff, and that don't you think that just maybe God might have chosen you because you're the right age, because that's who he needs. So what about you? That's a call of God on our life for the moment. So it doesn't mean that we're leaving York, but it means that, that York will be exporting what it is and what it has to touch the greater Salt Lake area. That's what about me, but what about us? What about you? See, what I've told you about and compacted so much of my life, I'm really serious that when you have a dream, reality bends to accommodate the dream. I was sick, but reality bent back to health to accommodate the dream. We didn't know where we were supposed to be, but reality bends to accommodate the dream. It's not for you to figure the details, it's just for you to be willing to say, Lord, let me have a dream. God, give me a vision so that I'm not just walking through this life, doing the stuff that I see, experiencing the things that happen, but actually it all begins to bend and shake related to the call of God on my life. If it was working for me all the way back from 1901 when my grandfather was born in a workhouse in Hemsworth, South Yorkshire, to bring us to points like this, it's been working in your life before you were ever aware, but I want you to become aware and say, God, what are you calling me to? What are you wanting from me? Do you have God's dream implanted in your heart? Can you see what God sees? The bigger question, what are you willing to do about it? Bow your heads with me.
Father, in this place tonight, as we have released words that, that flow not from a constructed speech, but from the reality of you at work in a life, choosing me, not, not, not because of my ability, but, but taking my availability and doing things that I could have never imagined would have been possible for that shy little South Yorkshire kid who moved here 54 years ago. But you've done it. Lord, I pray for every young person, every slightly older person, everybody who's even to middle age, and those who are really at the top end of the scale today, that your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, and on all flesh you will pour out your spirit. Do something with these words that I've spoken tonight, I pray, God. Let them bring something to life in hearts so that many in here will say, Lord, I want to see the dream. I want to see the vision. I want to embrace it. And I want to tell you, here I am. I'm willing. I want to hear your call so that where I go, what I do, who I become will be the result of you and your hand on my life for good. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been very patient. I've talked a long time. But there you go. There you go. All right. So, we love you. Be praying for us while we're in India, and uh, we'll come back with a good report. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. Then why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.